and that this is also sort of an interesting story in that you know to discover things we, we don't and you look all the way back through the history of science very often the scientist isn't going out there to discover something it's a sort of a, an event that happens on the way where discovery results hi my name's steve it's easy to talk about change and hard to do it someone has to lead but this can be a lonely path someone has to act the media is awash with stories about great entrepreneurs like steve jobs and elon musk People analyse what they do and how they work. We try to reconstruct their methodologies as if this will translate into duplicate success. But these are original thinkers and therefore their motivation is a key part of their story. Hi, my name is Amar. Today we talk to Julian Malnick, who founded the undersea mining company Nautilus Minerals. Hi, I'm Julian Malnick. I'm the founder of Nautilus Minerals and Direct Nickel. I'm a recognised innovator. In fact, I got the National Innovation Award in 2014. Julian has since gone on to be involved in several other innovative mining ventures. This includes Deep Space Industries, which is looking at mining asteroids, and Fluid Minerals and Direct Nickel, two companies which are both looking at designing new ways of metal extraction. This episode is a glimpse into those that lead change, a window into what lessons they have for us, and we find out what makes an innovator. Welcome to Exploration Radio. Now, Julian joined us on the line from Sydney, and unfortunately, that did have an effect on the audio quality in parts. We apologize for that. Lesson one. How do you define innovation? At the moment, I've got a um, uh, somebody who I've known for some time has actually he's a he's a mining engineer. He just finished an MBA, and um, and he just got to the end of that, and he came to me and he said, "Listen, I seriously want to learn enterprise." So he realises that it's simply a bunch of skills. You know, even when I talk to him, I'm, now I'm conscious I'm training him in in enterprise, and enterprise is entrepreneurship. I always imagine it like being a uh, a chef. You know, like you can look in the fridge you know, go down to the supermarket, you can look in the garden and you can look around you, but then how to get from there to satisfying 12 people for dinner at around your dinner table, is there's a step in, in there that involves a bit of risk, right? So it's a process where you sort of have to intuitively understand how this event's going to, you visualise everyone sitting around the table eating, drinking and feeling terrific, and you being the cause. So let's start off uh, at the top. How do you describe innovation? And what does the word mean to you? It's a great question, Ahmad. Yeah, and I see a lot of people taking a different interpretation of it. If you look at the word, I think what it jumps out at me is innovate, you know, like make new. To innovate is to make new of something. Now, renovate is to make something old new, and innovate is to make something to engender the new, if you like. So that's the urgency that comes with the word is that way I see it. So your career to date now has involved quite a lot of innovation or doing things uh, out of the ordinary. What got you to go down this path? My parents were both innovative people and creative. So I come from a creative family. My mother was uh, one of the great uh, photographers. My father was a great architect. And I was sort of black sheep scientist, you know. So, <laughs> um, you know, there, there's a creative element to innovation, to making something new. It's a creative process. And I think that my science really took a big lead from my, my mother and father and, and the general more artistic environment I grew up in. But I, uh, I certainly, um, actually, it's quite an interesting stage because I went as a really young guy when I was 12 I started an apprenticeship in, in pottery, ceramics, right? And I just took to it immediately. In fact, in the end, I, I never paid for a, for a day of tuition. I was the apprentice in the pottery. I did all the work. I built kilns. I mixed glazes. I recycled the clay for all the other students. Um, all my weekends after school, everything was always around ceramics. I remember being so fascinated by it was that if you take, like, earth and water, right, clay, and then you add air, you know, so it goes hard, 
and then you add other minerals and then you put it in the fire, you're dealing with the four elements. And the thing that you're consistently adding, apart from your labor, is ingenuity. It's man's ingenuity. You know, and I just used to blow me away to build a kiln, to make the thing to go in it, to, to get the wood and put it inside and, and have it all, have all your mates come around and see this amazing event take place. And that's really the story of man. You know, an iPhone is an extremely sophisticated pot. So, so it just led on from that. But I, for me, it was a very, most authentically uh, original thing for me was the sort of idea that you were dealing with the elements around you, which is essentially what miners do. You know, they, they make use of the, the physical uh, world around them. That was uh, the creative part. And then how did that lead into innovation and entrepreneurship? Well, we might unpack that a little bit as we go, eh? I find that really interesting because, you know, one of the definitions of entrepreneur is not necessarily like the business side, it's just that they have a passion for creating. So I find that really interesting after your, you know, how, where you started, that you obviously had a passion for creating and that was pottery, but you could probably extend that to say that maybe your love for entrepreneurship comes from the fact that you like to create uh, new things and they tend to be companies rather than objects. Yeah, I, I think in the, you know, the ceramic example is that you make the difference. You know, you've got all this sort of static stuff around you and that you, you buy by putting your hands into it, it changes, you know, and it comes away as this sort of sloppy old pile of clay. And then through you applying yourself into it, you come away with a, you know, a shiny, beautiful, curved form that somebody wants to pay you money for. So there was this sort of natural idea that you're always kind of making something and entrepreneurship, you know, does link back to that somewhere, but it's, uh, it's understanding what the advantage of you being you is. You know, being an entrepreneur can be quite rewarding, yeah. but it can also yeah. be quite frustrating at the same time. So how, how did you get yourself into this caper? Um, look, it is really rewarding, Ahmad, uh, but I guess one of the hardest things is that you have to be, be comfortable with people not agreeing with you, you know, or not having thought what you're thinking. And there's, a, there's an element of loneliness that goes with, with innovation, which is that, you know, you're going to a new planet and you're the first person to put a foot on that planet. That's how it often feels for the innovator. Lesson two, mining under the sea. I always read Time magazine since I believe I was 10 years old. And I remember reading about a ship called the Glomar Explorer, which um, is sort of where my fascination started. Uh, the Glomar Explorer was a ship built by Howard Hughes, notionally, on the face of things, to mine manganese nodules in the mid-Pacific in 5,000 metres of water. I mean, it was an extraordinary venture. It turned out I met a lot of people from that later in my career but who did, the, did that exercise. But the, the real purpose of the Glomar Explorer and how it used the contract was actually after, after they did the successful mining trial, they used this vessel to then go and recover half of a Russian submarine, which the Americans had seen go down. But so it was all designed actually to, to lift a um, submarine into the moon pool of the ship and to take it back. So it was under contract to the CIA and the, the, the cover was that it was going out there to mine manganese nodule. And that was a fascinating story. I followed the manganese nodule story and, and they're, you know, in my view, a highly inferior geological, you know, metal resource compared to the C4 massive sulphide because they're in three times the water depth and they're a tenth of the grade or something like that. Of course, Nautilus is a, a deep sea uh, miner of high grade copper and zinc that mines uh, high-grade copper and zinc in 1,500 metres of water. I guess uh, among explorers listening, they'll understand that what is growing on the seafloor there is actually a volcanogenic massive sulphide. Now, we renamed them for, to give it a little bit of a, um, a catch. Uh, we, we call them seafloor massive sulphide. Let's talk about your first uh, enterprise, which was Nautilus. How did that come about? Uh, in 1993, I'll politely describe it as uh, underemployed, turned to the, the resource writing business and journalism, and I had been a good creative writer, and so I used my science to 
get a start writing for Golden Medals Gazette, and then I became the editor of the Minor magazine. What I discovered was in the way you get treated if you hand somebody a card that says geologist on it, to uh, if they hand you a card that says journalist, you could command the attention of any CEO. You could talk to them about anything you wanted. So it was a really exciting um, step for me in my life. As editor of the Minor, I was called to um, Delhi Road, North Ride, Sydney, to the CSIRO office for this great event, which was the first high-grade copper and zinc sulphide from the Bismarck Sea brought back and being opened on Australian soil. And uh, Dr. Ray Bin was the Australian scientist at the CSIRO, and I offer Ray great credit for his work and um, always has. And I, you know, I, I tried to I tried to give him some stock at the time, but he worked for the CSIRO and couldn't take it. So. When I was growing up, I thought this is a, you know, like to, to a geologist, this is like the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb. But when I got there, I was the only journalist, and it was sort of late in the afternoon, and there was me watching Ray open his the box. You could see the open the took the lid off, you could see this was massive chalcopyrite and massive sphalerite. I had a joint venture running at the time on a cobalt shell up at, at Mount Dell and, um, uh, and that all suddenly looked very hard because here was this high-grade cop metal straight from the seafloor. And, and that's, where, that's where, you know, that was the moment where I really kind of tweaked. But then there were a few steps after that, you know, to get the thing rolling. When you saw this opportunity for the first time, like, I mean, what did you think? Like, this was a one in a yeah. million opportunity, or did you think that it needed more work? Oh, I just, I could smell the, um, I just, I think immediately, because of the grade. In fact, the first thing I did was write a story to the world and said, hey, listen, Ray Benz is all over this. This is a real breakthrough. Get into it. And when I rang him back about four months later and nothing had happened, you know, that was actually the light bulb moment. I, I literally went, that's it. You know, that's, that was the moment because I knew that the fact that people weren't interested in it meant there was an opportunity because I could do that. I could tell the story. I could bring together the technical data and create the narrative, the investable narrative that would show people how big the prize was at the other end. Because in the end, in mining tonnage and grade, you have to paint the picture. The, the first deposit that was ever found of metal on the seafloor was in, was in the Red Sea. And... Um, it's actually in a rift valley, and it's completely unusual. You know, it's not typical at all. It's actually in fine mud in a rift. So when we saw this as a sort of a physically vertical mound sitting on top of volcanic uh, rocks on the seafloor, and that sort of married with what we knew about massive sulphide, you know, so it sort of clicked that if you've got broken hill here, then there's going to be broken hill on the seafloor. So therefore, they're going to be big. However, whatever we discovered, there's going to be as much here on the seafloor, unburied, undeformed, unmetamorphosed, unoccupied by landowners, and it's all pretty much on the geological sutures. You know the locust because it's going to be right on a close to a, a rift grind. So you can actually predict pretty much the line where they were going to be. And and then there were we learned all the science about how to track plumes, you know, by following raised science, I, the fundamentals about how the exploration worked was in their methodology, you know. So it was all done then with a really primitive method. You know, they, Ray Bin did amazing work. The, the Japanese had an instrument that was worth $12.5 million for exploring the seafloor. The Americans sort of thumbed their nose at them and built one for $1.5 million. Um, and then Ray uh, captured the first footage I ever saw of a massive seafloor mound um, using a piece of gear that was cost him $12,500 to build. And actually the first piece of rock that was ever collected was jammed on the front of the camera unit when it slammed into a, into a mound and up came this great big 30% zinc chunk stuck on the front of the camera. Incredible pioneering work. I guess I want to pivot a little bit to how technical input plays a role into this. So yeah, there's the science is always, you know, Science is how we make everything and always has been. You know, science is wealth creation. I learned a lot um, by reading Offshore Magazine, which is a hydrocarbon journal out of the US. I learned what equipment was available. So, you know, one example was people would think, oh, if I put an electric motor down there, it's not going to work. It's, a, you know, the you know, fast. 
we found there were suppliers who for many years had been producing electric motors that had an oil filled rotor, right? So the standard submarine technology. Bringing that together, you say, well, look, you know, it's not, this is, you know, to quote that famous footballer, it's not rocket surgery. There was all this sort of ingredients thing. And, and when we went and spoke to the hydrocarbon guys, they were all sort of like, oh yeah, why, why aren't you? You know, we sounded like prospectors to them. They were so familiar with deep water. And they used to, they used to look at us and, you know, peer into the foyer to see if there wasn't a mill tied up in the foyer. You know, they, you know, they, they just, so we, we were very slow to get there, which I think we'll touch on this later as about miners as innovators. Yeah, look, bringing the science together was, was a really important part of what I could do in, in pre presenting a narrative and presenting a, a, a vision of where we could go and how we could follow the tons and grades, terrific grades, good tons, unburied, sitting there in the ocean, and all you had to do was, you know, use the fact that the water was there rather than, you know, treating it with apprehension. Lesson three, aiming big and creating your own path. But, um, you know, that's the, uh, I, I think that the Nautilus story is, is really still in its, its absolute infancy now. There are probably, I guess there's tens of thousands of deposits between here and, you know, say, New Zealand and Japan. And that in the future, uh, is still the frontier, the major frontier for the future is copper and zinc is the C4 massive sulphide deposits because they're high grade, because they don't have lots of rock in them, they're not buried, doesn't take you a lot of energy. You're halfway to the port where it's going. One thing I want to ask is, I mean, a lot of the ventures that you're involved in, there seems to be a kind of a common theme. They tend to be really big, big opportunities, uh, and they tend to be looking at things into the future. Is is that something that you consciously do? Like, is that a way that you vet opportunities? Yeah, well, I mean, um, the person on the side thing, maybe, if you want somebody to do something that's technically risky, it's good to be able to, I always say, mate, the biggest fight failing in the mining industry is people get the number of zeros wrong. So, you know, I think, you know, they, they, they try to, they try to take a risk on something, but it's never going to, you know, it's too small a deposit or the economics is too skinny or, you know, so better off to start with a bigger concept. So I consciously do look for the bigger concept because you can get somebody, there's, there's a bigger prize. And, and there's a sort of the blue sky is really important because people think, oh, look, if I fail on this one, I've got dozens of others to, to try it out on. It's not just a single shot on a single deposit. And so, you also have room to move a lot more as well in bigger opportunities. Yeah, like in a small thing, you're so close to the line probably that it's tough to keep walking that line. That's right. What if you don't? What if it doesn't drill out? You know, what if you only ever get to 400,000 tonnes and, you know, you, you, you try to stretch that deposit you know, and I can think of a few like that have been, you know, they've been through a half a dozen prospectuses and they've never, always the bridesmaid and never the bride. Did you have a feeling of when you were working on Nautilus that it was going to be something, something groundbreaking? In hindsight, it was probably more daring than, than I admitted at the time, but people see that, you know, I mean, you can call it a track record. We were big news, you know, when, when the titles were granted, we went straight to the front page of the New York Times. The media rating agency rang us, wrote us this letter and said, just want you to know that we've never ever awarded in all of our 20 years of history, we've never awarded a story as highly as your, yours. You got a, a 9.1 because you had a follow-up story, you were on the front page of the New York Times, you had this journal, top journalist, you had colour, you had data, you know, and it, it was... You know, we just got like, nodding going, yeah, I'll keep that. Did you feel like you were doing something that was extraordinary at the time? Because of the reluctance of our industry to really back innovation or back an innovator or back somebody who's disruptive or doing something different, it is lonely territory, right? So, so and with loneliness comes hardship, you've got to raise your own money, you kind of, you know, you've got kids and things to worry about on one side. But with Nautilus, there was such a vast realm of opportunity. Nautilus had something like, you know, 200,000 square kilometres 
when I went to Tonga, I, I staked eight and a half degrees of latitude, you know, a huge area. Well, that was really amazing too, because when I got there, there was like the mining act was only one and a half pages long. So I actually created the forms, did all the method and showed how they were num- the, the graticules were numbered and created nine applications and, and then took them down to the guy who was the minister. I guess, uh, you know, he probably did more fishing than anything else. And I gave him the nine applications with, and I'd even made up the amount of the application fee, right? And look, years later, he had, they, the country actually reverse engineered a mining act to go with my application. There were times when I sort of actually had this feeling like I'd been chosen by the opportunity. I couldn't believe I was so lucky to be the guy in the world who was leading the mining of seafloor massive sulfides, you know, and on really bleak days. And it's one thing I used to say to myself was, wow, I mean, I can't believe it. Pinch me. There was also a, um, you know, a sense that um, time was on our side. Even if we didn't achieve something in a day, because of the timeline and we're moving into the future the whole time. So some people don't actually see the, the future as a place where we're going to end up. You know, we are going to be there in 10 years' time. So even on days that I knew that we didn't, I didn't achieve much or I didn't have a budget to achieve as much as I knew I wanted to, you know, I still had a sense that we were a day closer. You know, we've never been, I used to say to myself, I've never been in such a good position with this project. So, so there was a sort of sense that, that I had, which is probably just a, kind of a personal attribute, you know, the, this, this idea that of good fortune and, and of, you know, the, the bounty of resources and, and their use to man and the fundamental productivity behind all of that, maybe going back to my, you know, ceramic days, but that sort of, you know, accessing you know, frontier. And now, a word from our sponsors. If you work in a junior level job in mining and want to boost your credentials to break into management, but can't quit to go back to university, consider the new bachelor's degree in the Mining Engineering Technology Program at Queen's University. It's fully online and flexible, meaning you can earn while you learn. Want more info? Check out the details at engineering.queensu.ca slash CME. That's engineering.queensu.ca slash CME. Or if you happen to be at the Canadian Mining Expo this month in Timmins, Ontario, then go say hi to the guys from Queen's University. Now let's get back to the show. Lesson four, from the seafloor to asteroids. But we can actually see the future in some way. It's not like we just put an handkerchief around our head and a glass ball in front of us. But you can actually work out what the demand is going to be for nickel in 10 years' time pretty well. You know, just follow the stainless steel. You know, maybe we find an alternative to stainless steel, but, you know, I don't think so. If you're looking, you can see these convergence points. 50 years ago, no one seemed to own the land. It was just kind of whoever went there. You know, now 100% of the world is owned today by someone for some historic reason. So we can see that sort of closing in. Not being on land meant that we didn't have land owners. It was a big plus. So we can see things about the future and we, there are convergences if you take increasing energy costs so for grinding, depleting grade, you've got land access issues, you've got environmental issues with tailings and you've got a whole lot of things that are happening. There is actually a convergence that says get in the ocean and go after sea foremost with sulfide. So there's a way of reading the future. And of course, you know, if everything happens now, well then it's really important to occupy the future so that when people come down that line and they walk into your foyer, they're already standing on your rug because you've already laid them out there. I mean, you made this comment before about that how, like, you know, the success of Nautilus allows people to have belief in you. I guess I want to revisit a little bit when you're starting out with Nautilus. You know, when you go and tell people that you want to mine uh, on the seafloor or even things like asteroid, I mean, there would be certainly a level of skepticism there by people. Skepticism is something that we, that we welcome. Me being a skeptic is the only reason I survived childhood. You know, I, I thought, you know, that's probably five metres taller than I can jump. 
cynicism, we got pretty good at telling the difference, you know. Cynicism is an attitude, skepticism is a test. We used to get a lot of skepticism and now I actually like it. Now I like it when, when somebody looks at you with that blank estrangement and, and, and it's like they're, they're literally saying, I don't believe you. I would think, oh, that's a good sign. Yeah, I know this sign. I've been, I'm familiar with this. I like this. In fact, I'm more uncomfortable now if everyone believes you straight away, you know, because <laughs> it means you haven't, you're not the guy who can make the big difference in, in, in wheeling it around. The asteroid thing is really funny. It's a good example because you think, oh, yeah, mining out of space. Well, yeah, good on you, Julian. You know, you've, what are you doing now? You know, can't leave you alone for a minute. These guys came and found me. They read a paper that I'd written on raising capital for Frontier Ventures, I think it was called, and, you know, you explain it to people and you think, oh, well, how can this possible? It's crazy. No? At the moment, it costs us $10,000 a kilo to blast, you know, water like this up into space, right? So the cheapest thing is worth $10,000 a kilo. Turns out asteroids are only travelling slightly faster than the Earth or as we rotate around the sun, and many of them are 50% water. Now, water you can use as a propellant. You have a 24-hour energy out there because unlike on Earth, with solar plants, the sun goes down. Up there, you're permanently in sunshine. So what is mining then? Mining is using stuff to do stuff that we need. So, so up there, you know, we need water. And I think actually, last I, I heard, Deep Space Industries was entertaining um, a request from uh, NASA to provide 100 tonnes of water. If you look at it, you say, oh, there's a big economic advantage because we'll be the supplier to NASA. There's an economic dividend there. And there are lots of other economic opportunities. Lesson five. Innovation is not about gadgets. I thought about what development is to me, and development is like where you build a slightly better razor that instead of throwing it away every three days like we used to, you know, now a disposable razor can, can last for three months, you know. So that's development. And innovation is, in 1930s, they invented the electric razor, right? It got up and it became an entire new market. That was a, a real innovation. So innovation, it can be in accounting, it can be in human resources, but there's a lot of things that it's not, and, and development is one of the things that it's not. Big mining companies, they say, oh, we're, we lead the world in innovation, we've got driverless trucks now. You know, over in Silicon Valley, they've got driverless cars on the road. If, you, if you're a mining company and you claim that as your innovation, I think you're claiming it from the automotive industry, right? Somebody else has innovated, and you've brought that onto your site. Do you think that sometimes we're a little bit too trapped by the concept that innovation has to be big? I'll tell you one thing that's really impressed on me. I went to an um, innovation loving with the mighty company Anglo-American. You know, the games where you had to show how innovative, you know, they gave you all these things and you had to drop an egg off, you know, and I thought, you know, it's just great, you know, it's like a kid's party. <laughs> but... Um, what I noticed was everyone wants to build a gadget. Everyone was there talking about this in-situ mining. And they all came, they drew this thing on the wall about in-situ mining and we had this, you know, everyone walked around and looked at each other's concepts and, and then there was voting and we all came up with the best concept. Um, great, you know, but they were prepared to do the, the, that part of the innovation, which was to imagine and maybe design a gadget or, or to, to, to do that part. But I was really struck by... You know, when you put people in a room, they want to build a gadget. You know, so, so often what we're trying to do is not build a gadget. You know, Nautilus was used gadgets, but it was actually just reconceiving a resource frontier. And the, and the direct nickel metallurgical process, which uses nitric acid, the, the precursor sites for the, the, the nitric acid um, came from Charlotte, Carolina. But that was, uh, again, it was a little bit of both. You know, we, we applied our science and methods and hired the right people. But the precursor science, there was some, you know, there was some rock and roll that went before us and we used that to build our tunes. 
So I think this is a really important point that, you know, like they, it's like that saying by, I think it's like by Picasso that, you know, some of the best ideas can be borrowed from others. And I don't think we sometimes do that probably as well as we probably should. No, and why, why is that? You know, I mean, what do you reckon? Ah, uh, I just, I mean, this is going to go down the rabbit hole of, I think, the why the industry doesn't deal with innovation really well. In my opinion, I think it is because we don't really have necessarily a backbone of collaboration in the industry. I think, you know, people sometimes want to do things on their own accord. So, Well, that, that's fair enough. I mean, look, if Steve Jobs did it on his own, much, you know, in a walled garden, and he did really well. In fact, quite often, putting that wall up is really important to, to keep the detractors out. So together can work or alone can work. But one of the biggest conflicts in, you know, if you look why doesn't a company like uh, I won't mention all of the big Australian mining companies. We've had them on our share register in both Nautilus and Direct Nickel. But I would say one of the things that is inherent is that most people in a company come there for employment. You know, they, they want to pay the school fees, right? Their primary mission is in conflict with what they have to do at work very often because very often what they have to do at work is be nice to Ahmad so that I don't get on his wrong side. Um, don't disrupt the ideas that, that are already existing because, you know, the, the, the self-interest thing is very strong. And we form, people form little political groups within the company that say, oh, look, this is acceptable science. And often what they do in that science is development. It's not innovation. And really to understand what innovation is makes you come to who innovators are. You have to be prepared to challenge people. You have to be prepared to um, confront their thinking. Not everyone interprets an opportunity as an opportunity. Many people interpret them as a threat. Right? So, so how do you create that mandate, that cultural mandate, to find the innovator? And because you might, you might have it wrong too. You might somebody might just look like they're a good innovator. You know, they do the innovative work in a, in a big company, and they get to run the innovation department. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. This is a good point that, yeah, like in big companies, the way their corporate culture is set up, if you're the type of person that wants to test boundaries, you're probably not going to be someone that will rank high in that structure because you, for lack of a better word, you'll be a pain in that organization. Lesson six, inspiring the right people. It's a bit of alchemy in getting the right people and then making the company investable, you know, because you've got to attract money to then pay them. So it's a bit of a catch-22 between, you know, how you're going to graph this thing forward and, you know, design it up into the future. But yeah, it is, it's, it's tricky to be able to give the investor the membership that he needs in your company and to promise He's not looking for a guarantee, he's just looking for the promise, you know, likely success. And um, to sort of create that balance between who you're hiring and how you're going to get there. And so the, the confidence element is really big. Communicating is really important and so is the science. And that's why I was, you know, I was sort of grateful that I'm a scientist. Science is fundamentally where prosperity comes from. this last little bit that you talked about, is that how you go about handling a group of technical people in your company? <laughs> it's a little bit of a touchy subject, Ahmad, because um, I, um, I, I rely totally. I mean, I, I'm very good at finding the people that we need to do things. And the best thing you can do is give them the vision. They look into my eyes to see what the vision is. I'm staring at a laser dot on the wall and there's people running around in front of me. So getting people to stand next to me aligned and go for that vision is really important. I'm more of an inspiring type rather than a controlling type of project leader. You know, that's, that's how I do it. You do get this other phenomenon where you don't have absolute control. You know, like as a, I'm a shareholder, diluting shareholder. Everyone who comes in, I start with 100% and pretty soon, you know, lots of other people have shareholdings and they form voting blocks. What has happened on a couple of occasions is that once the, the, the project becomes colonised by people and then sort of a union forms of thinking and they're no longer testing their ideas against the vision. You know, they're saying, oh, no, we've got it right. 
sort of get the big company forming in your little company. So that's where I really admire people like Steve Jobs. And look, he, he had to walk the plank. They colonized his company and chucked him out. Then he went and formed um, Pixar and had another brilliant career success there. And then they had to pull him back in to rescue Apple and Scully had to walk. You know, Scully was perfectly the wrong person. So that's an example of how projects easily become colonized. You know, and people lose that sort of intellectual mindset that goes with success. So that's a that's my one. Uh, you know, I think that's that's probably my greatest failing is that you know I, I really haven't been able to maintain that. Uh, I've maintained the thinking, but I haven't been able to maintain the influence over the project in a couple of cases. Lesson seven: failure. You know, I think that the system is rigged against um, alternative independent thinkers. You know, it, it's inherently not a frame of mind that we yet want to see walking in the, to the foyer in, you know, Collins Street or wherever our office is. I judge a hackathon for the unearthed people. And, um, you know, you, you walk into that room, the room's just buzzing with brain cells. You know, it's, it's, you can feel it. They've got that intellectual appetite running. And um, I think that's the cultural feeling that we need to find so that people don't have all their little silos and the systems and, you know, the management control units, but rather they, they, they've, they've become a more open space. You know, we're at a disadvantage because we're spread all over Australia as miners and, you know, most of us have got our head in a hole somewhere. But I still think there's, you know, this cultural change has to happen now. And I think it's next decade ahead is, uh, is going to be big for miners and innovation. I guess I've, I've taken more of your time than I wanted to. So one last question I have is, how do you deal with failure? I just shoot them. No, no kidding. Um, <laughs> no wonder you're running out of people to work with. I mean. <laughs> No, um, look, uh, failure hurts. Um, I've had, um, there is nothing quite like the of emotional insult you will get through failure in business. And to that, I'd just say, you know, don't ride the ski lift if you can't stand the fall. Exploration Radio is brought to you by Steve in the Mod. Our producer and all-round go-to guy is Dan Hershowitz. This podcast is recorded at the Perth Music House. If you'd like to know more about Exploration Radio, check us out on explorationradio.com or you can also find us on Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn. And as always, if you like this podcast, please review us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio or wherever you get your podcasts from. Until next time, let's keep exploring. Well, I've got a very good example of when the major mining industry seriously wanted to get rid of me, and, and it was when we started the Sydney Mining Club model. I was asked to join a committee of the Institute, the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. I, I sat down and wrote a blueprint for the reform of the old IMM and then handed around all the lads and they all made comments and stitched it all together. But I didn't give it to the Institute, I gave it to the Australian newspaper and the next day there was... <laughs> headline that said Institute gets dinosaur warning <laughs> so so I had a guy from BHP and Rio and I had all the people trying to bite the end of my nose off and you know two and a half years later they voted in the first constitutional change in 102 years we created the Sydney Mining Club as an illustration of the sort of thing we were looking for and the other day we had our 20th birthday <laughs>